I welcome you uh, on behalf of GeoSec. We are uh, right now hosting a fireside chat with Mr. Bhaskar Pramanik, uh, who was the former MD of Microsoft India, along with Saurav Sanyal, who is leading a consultancy firm called Strategica. Uh, along with both of our dignitaries, I also welcome Rahul. Rahul is the CEO of GeoSec. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank our uh, you know all the partners who have helped uh, in in uh, you know spreading information about this wonderful session i would like to thank ihub gesha gcci and this respective members and office bearers along with uh, a very special thanks to minister of uh, electronics and it and and its uh, msh which is a meaty startup hub for for uh, you know uh, spreading the best information about the fireside chat i would like to pass on to rahul to, to move ahead with the session. Thank you, Malai. Uh, good morning, everybody who has joined us through Zoom and uh, who has joined us through Facebook. Uh, uh, I'm so glad that uh, Mr. Pramanik has been able to spend some good time with us uh, uh, in, this, in this pandemic crisis. As you all know, we've been taking... Uh, and doing a number of uh, sessions to activate our webin uh, to activate our ecosystem uh, of of startup uh, enablers and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 we have Saurav, who is also a part of our uh, our board at GeoSec, and uh, he would be running this chat with with Pascal. Uh, I'm also told that some uh, some 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 really uh, key members of the local industry ecosystem, including Dr. In, including Dr. Mr. Uh, Durgesh Butch, who is the president of GCCI, is also joined. So welcome, Mr. Butch, and uh, other members of Geisha, other members of uh, GCCI who have been able to join. Uh, uh, you're most welcome. And uh, we are planning a number of other sessions in in the coming weeks. Uh, moreover, as far as today's programs go. Uh, Attendees are free to ask questions uh, through the chat, uh, through the through the Q and A module of Zoom, and at the end of it, we'll pick up a few questions uh, to ask to the panel. Uh, we'd also uh, uh, ask the uh, Facebook attendees to feel free to ask any questions that you may have, uh, and uh, we'll we'll take all the questions uh, together. Without uh, much further ado, I think Saurav, it is over to you and Oscar uh, to to start this conversation. Uh, thanks, Rahul, and thank you to the GUSEC team for putting this together. Um, and we'd love to welcome the viewers to um, what we are looking to do at GUSEC, wherein we want uh, we are bringing in some of the top decision makers in the country to give insights uh, into both their business and their industry. So with that, I'd love to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Bhaskar Pramanik, who is a veteran of the Indian IT and technology industry and alumni of IIT Kanpur. He's held several positions and in a number of countries as the MD of Oracle and, and Sun Microsystems. Until recently, he was the chairman of uh, Microsoft India. He's currently on the board of a number of companies such as the State Bank of India, as well as uh, the senior advisor to Rothschild. Uh, he's also advising a number of startups. So thank you, Bhaskar, for joining us at GeoSec uh, so and giving us some insights uh, into uh, how the industry uh, is looking. Um, so to start off with Bhaskar, I think, um, like I mentioned, you graduated from IIT Kanpur. Uh, what were your goals and ambitions at the time? Uh, when you started. Can you tell us a bit more about your journey as it were? Okay, so, you know, frankly, um, I'm not too sure how relevant that is because that was uh, close to over 50 years ago. Uh, so therefore, it was a different India at that point of time. And uh, we didn't even have computer science in IIT Kanpur. We used to all get the broad degree of electrical engineering. And you could choose computer, uh, various different computer courses which I chose to do because we had some phenomenal equipment there, all mainframe based systems, but that's how I started my journey from a computer perspective. But I think what is more important is not what did I want to do, but uh, what did I get out of my uh, education? 
So, you know, when you pass out from IIT, you have multiple choices. You can go for further studies abroad. You can do your management graduation degree. You can get a technical job or you could get any other kind of job. And uh, I actually had a choice of all four. And then finally, what I chose was to become a management trainee in DCM. But I think, you know, what is important is that you have to understand who you are when you graduate and what have you learned. And if you believe that uh, technical education can basically only give you, um, you know, deep knowledge of a particular subject, whether it's electrical engineering or chemical engineering, then frankly, you're wrong because uh, what you will learn through the rest of your career is far, far greater. Or you do a master's in which case, then you can actually get much more specialized. What I've learned from IIT was the ability to learn. That is for the rest of my career, I actually figured out two things. One, how to go about solving problems, irrespective of whether they were management problems or technical problems. And number two was the capacity to constantly relearn and reskill myself. Because you can imagine in the course of the 50 years, we started, I started off with mainframe computers. And then when I uh, retired from uh, Microsoft as a chairman, we were talking about artificial intelligence and robotics and artificial um, uh, AR and virtual reality and, art and uh, augmented reality. We were talking about blockchains. Uh, those are the you know, machine learning, deep learning. So therefore, there was a huge difference in terms of uh, what I was taught what I and what I actually practice when I actually graduated. So continuous learning is very critical, the ability to solve problems. And that's what I think my education helped me. Uh, the other thing I'd like to share with, your, with the participants is that if you believe that you can plan your career from the day you graduate uh, with certainty, you can rest assured that that never happens. In fact, everything which you plan for is most likely not going to happen. So it is far better to be opportunistic, seize the opportunities, and more important, do what you are very passionate about. That to me is really the secret, secret of having a solid career. Right. Uh, so Bhaskar, uh, you mentioned that I think continuous learning is a very, was a very important part of uh, how you grow both as a person and in your career. Uh, the pace of change, however, has dramatically uh, changed over the, you know, industries are changing faster. And therefore, how do you manage this change both at a personal level uh, as well at a, at a company level? How do companies like Microsoft, how do they uh, or, or startups keep abreast of this uh, change and this pace? How do you manage or plan for it? Okay, so let me talk uh, about uh, learning at an individual level. So, you know, obviously when I uh, passed out from, uh, or when I sort of, not passed out, when I retired from uh, uh, Microsoft, what was one of my biggest fears was how was I going to continuously learn? Because when you work for a large corporation, learning comes from many different sources. It comes from your customers. It comes from your peers. Uh, we had some of the brightest technology minds. It comes from people who may not necessarily have been in Microsoft, but were in other companies who had worked for me. You get access to academia, you get access to startups, and therefore there is a lot of in constant interaction, uh, industry associations, where you actually keep picking up new topics and get better understanding. You have online courses, and part of your you know, overall job experience itself gives you the ability to learn. So my challenge was that what happens when I retired? And that's where my network came in very useful. So even now today, a lot of the large companies, the CTOs were people who had worked for me. I'm constantly in touch with them. I therefore try to keep myself abreast of what are the latest developments in the field of technology. And uh, across a wide variety of different areas, I actually am uh, constantly learning through online courses, Udemy for example, or, and I'm a subscriber to Harvard Business Review. So I do the management courses from there. And I continue to also in the companies on which I am the board, for example, with State Bank of India, I'm, uh, I chair the IT strategy committee uh, with uh, T TN, um, TCNS, which is a woman's apparel company in retail, uh, publicly listed company. 
I actually guide them in terms of their technology strategy, how to use analytics and machine language, machine learning to be basically be able to understand the customer's demands. How can they automate their stores? How can they do a better job online? So that, those are the, that's the way I pick up. With Rothschild, I'm constantly interacting with very large startups, not just here in India, but also globally. So that's how, you know, from a personal level, it, it is your passion, it is your interest, and you always take the opportunity to learn more and more. And quite frankly, startups are the biggest source of new thoughts and ideas. A lot of the others, established companies, established, uh, you know, established uh, CTOs of established companies, they tend to be perhaps a few, um, uh, you know, few months before they get to the latest because the tried and proven is what they will actually apply. You normally won't use the most advanced technologies to solve today's problem because it takes too much of time. So therefore, I find the startups are the most exciting because they're always using the latest of technologies. And sometimes they're actually adapting and using and going beyond what current technology can offer. So therefore, that's a very, very critical and a very important source. So for large organizations, like let's say a Microsoft, uh, very clearly, we have extremely bright, competent, and smart people who are constantly looking beyond the horizon, in a sense, looking beyond corners. And if you look at the CEO of Microsoft, uh, Satya Nadella, I think that's his great ability to be able to look around corners and look and understand where technology can help mankind. And therefore, he did, uh, puts and uh, invests in research and development to develop those new technologies, new products, and new applications, et cetera. So it, in, a, in a large company, it starts with the CEO and then across a wide spectrum of different people who actually look at where. And the way in which they innovate is to put into research and development. Uh, for example, a company like Microsoft or Google, they'll spend 10 to 12% of their uh, in, uh, you know, of their revenue into R&D. And this is to look for products which are three to five years in the horizon. Uh, in a smaller scale, let's take, a comp let's take Microsoft in India. We focused, we had a large engineering facility out here, both the research and development as well as engineering. And uh, we actually found that one of the uh, applications which were lacking in uh, the uh, lacking in uh, uh, in India was basically uh, a, a chat for enterprise, uh, something like a WhatsApp, but for the enterprise. And uh, our engineering team had actually put together a solution which we call Kaizala. Kaizala is based on the Marathi term WhatsApp. WhatsApp. So we called it um, uh, WhatsApp for enterprise, but we gave it an Indian name, Kaizala. And we actually started promoting it. I actually bootlegged. I had you know, a big, large budget when I was the chairman of Microsoft. And I bootlegged to try and see its user applicability. And therefore, how could we take it to market? It actually turned out to be a success, not as a consumer product, but as an enterprise, where security was important, where integration with Office was important. And when Satya saw it, he liked it so much that he took it back to the US and put it under a formal engineering process. So again, innovation in India to solve a local need, but which now became a global product. Um, so Bhaskar, you know, you talked about uh, innovation and also uh, one of the key challenges some of our um, startups face is uh, access to mentorship. And of course, uh, that's something that JUSEC uh, takes seriously. We try yeah. and... and uh, no. So one of the challenges uh, our, uh, many of our startups face is access to mentors and mentorship and that's something we uh, take seriously at Geosec. Uh, is there um, any formal process within Microsoft or otherwise wherein you looked at to uh, mentor new team members or new product teams and is there something we could learn from that? Yeah, mentoring, I think, is, uh, is one of the best ways to learn. And, uh, you know, I, um, 
I'm a little precise in my definition. So therefore, there are uh, two ways by which you can learn through others more experienced than you. One is through mentoring and the other one is to coaching. There's a difference between the two. When you talk about coaching, it's about uh, agreeing with your coachee what are the specific skills which he wants to develop and then you help him and coach him to get better at those specific skills. It's very, very uh, oriented towards enhancement of skills. That's what coaching is about. Mentoring is different. Mentoring is where the mentee has a certain problem. It could be not just technical, it could be managerial or work related, or it could be even personal related. And he is looking for a mentor who has faced similar such experiences and perhaps can help him guide him through his experience, not the experience of the mentee. So therefore, that's my formal definition between what is mentoring and what is coaching. So most large companies have very formal mentoring systems. Now, for mentoring to succeed, the mentee has to be very clear about what he wants to get mentored on. And therefore, self-awareness is very, very critical. In large organizations like Microsoft, we give the opportunity for employees, managers, and leaders to actually go through different questionnaires, through different sessions, to be able to understand who they are, what they are good at, what they will never be good at, and what areas where they need to continuously improve. And then we leave it to them to go and interact with different coaches or mentors to either enhance their skills in their weak areas or to feel good and satisfied in areas where they may never be good at, but how do they overcome those? So that's the way the formal process works. And I have had a lot of you know, uh, experience in terms of mentoring, whether it has been somebody who was a peer level below me, whether it was a reporter of mine, or even college students. But you know, choice of mentoring is really a function of what the mentee wants to get done. So for example, in a startup, if the mentee is a founder and he wants to solve a very specific, critical, uh, operational related issue, it is better for him to talk to another CEO of a startup who has been through that before. For him to come to me is perhaps doesn't make much sense because I won't be able to guide him on those kinds of operational issues. But let's say he becomes a $20 million company, that's when my skills in managing or working or running very large corporation with established processes, with uh, the um, ability to understand customer behaviors, how do you strategize, how do you plan, would be much more effective. So for mentees who have the opportunity, who need to be mentored, they need to choose their mentors very clearly depending upon the kind of challenge or problem which they want to get resolved. But it starts with self-awareness. It starts with the mentee clearly determining what he wants to get done. And he has to understand that the mentor will not reskill him, but will share his experiences so that he can understand what he needs to do differently. And that's uh, really insightful, uh, Bhaskar. Uh, now I wanted to look at leadership in general, and I think you've had an uh, opportunity fairly early in your career to work with some of the great leaders and decision makers uh, from Ratan Tata, then later on uh, with Satya. Is there anything uh, that we can get to learn from uh, them? How did you learn from them? And uh, was there any specific instances uh, which have had huge impact on you? Oh, huge. Huge. Uh, I think, you know, when you, and it's not just uh, Ratan Tata or Satya Nadella because they are so well known, but practically every one of my bosses um, um, and even my peers, I've actually learned from. And a lot of what you learn is by observing. And number two is asking questions. Observation is perhaps the most, most critical because how leaders act, how do they behave? is really, you know, really has an impact on, on people. 
And therefore, if you are a great leader, you always have to make sure that you, are, you, uh, you, know, you actually practice and you behave and you act based upon your principles. So when you talk about somebody like Satya, uh, sorry, like Ratan Tata, I mean, he is an individual who has a very high degree of integrity. And it's in, it's in everything which he does. Uh, it's, it's just the fairness with which he wants to treat all stakeholders. So I remember that once when, when I was working in Nelco and we were planning to get into IT systems, computer platforms, hardware and software. And he asked me to go to the US and uh, work with a large organization, large mini computer organization at that time in the 80s and to sign some sort of a joint venture agreement with them. And I told him, what is the brief? He says, I'll only give you one brief. That is, both sides need to make money. It has to be a win-win relationship. Now, a lot of other CEOs would have said, I want to get the lowest price. I want to make the highest margin. You figure out how to get it into India with the lowest cost. But that's not the way Ratan Tata's briefing was to me. He says, I want it to be a win-win. I want uh, that both sides should make money and it has to be done uh, completely as per the guidelines of the government of India. So that basically, you know, the co concept of principle, you know, how you can become very, very, um, you know, principled by observing people's behaviors. In the case of Satya, it was a lot more uh, impactful. And if uh, any of you have read his book called Hit Refresh, uh, a lot of what is written in the book is what I saw appear happening right in front of my eyes. Uh, I knew Satya even before he became the CEO of Microsoft. He used to be the VP of engineering. And even as a VP of engineering for cloud, he had come to India multiple times. And the intensity with which he used to, uh, you know, sort of talk to customers, uh, his desire to learn more from them, his complete empathy with employees, uh, you know, he was a kind of CEO who wouldn't, who would land in India and then not ask me, how's your business doing? He would never ask that. He would basically ask me, what are the challenges? What are your customers saying? What are the important areas or social issues in India which needs to be resolved? How can technology help? His approach was like that. So he was very empathic. And that's one of the things which I learned from him is empathy. That always try and listen to what the other side is saying, whether it's an employee, whether it's your boss, whether it's a family member or a friend, listen, understand, put yourself in their shoes and then you take a decision. Same thing with customers. Okay, so I can talk about many, many different such stories, but one of the things I learned from Satya, which sort of reinforced my belief over my career, that culture is more important than strategy. Values is what makes a an individual. You can trace your success back to your value system. And I've had a value system which has stood me in good stead right through my career. And why I think what I saw happening in Microsoft with Satya is this belief that, you know, it is culture which enables strategy. It is culture which enables you to choose the right strategy and what makes you successful. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's direct from uh, Drucker. Uh, very insightful again, Bhaskar. Uh, culture is obviously a very important part of large organizations. Is there anything that startups or smaller companies uh, can, uh, can do to build on culture as they grow? No, absolutely. In fact, a number of startups uh, whom I'm sort of in, involved with or have been involved with or who I'm currently mentoring some CEOs, uh, you know, there are three or four questions I asked them when I immediately, when I sort of interacting with them. And uh, with, with most of the startups, before I take on any kind of, um, you know, uh, regular position, I said, let's do a three month kind of a honeymoon because I want to understand you better. You need to understand who I am. But the first four questions I asked them, why do you exist? What is your purpose? Because if you do not, if your purpose is only to keep selling uh, daldat or a ghee or something to a particular consumer, ask yourself this question, can anybody else do that better than me? Is this contributing to my community? Is this contributing to the nation? Is it contributing to the world at large? If your purpose does not have any of those, then perhaps you will not stand the test of time. If you look at the large corporations today, 
which have survived, which have existed, it's because they have a very clear cut vision and a mission and a purpose. And it's not about just making money. It's about how they can contribute. So whether it's a Microsoft, which basically says that uh, we empower every individual and every organization on the planet to do more. That's what I would call a purpose which can stand the test of time. It used to be, Microsoft's purpose used to be a PC on everybody's desk. So once you got one and a half billion PCs in the world, which happened about 10 years ago, does that mean that your purpose as a company has lost? So when Satya did his new vision, he basically kept technology out of it because technology has a shelf life of a banana. If you build a company based only on a product, then it's very difficult to exist when that product and technology does not, uh, is not the latest. So PCs were okay when Bill Gates, you know, sort of invented the company. But when the mobile phones took over from PCs, does that mean that Microsoft should have curled up and died? Or should it have just gone into mobile phones? So I think, you know, Satya looked at it from a different perspective. And therefore, if you look at Microsoft's vision today, it does not have any element of technology in it. It can actually you know, be something which can last for another 100 years. So first question you ask, I ask a startup is, what is your purpose and does it contribute to the overall? The second is, what is the value that you bring and how does that value differentiate from your uh, competitors? That's very, very critical because if you don't have something which is of value, if it doesn't solve a specific customer need, then you will find that you will not be able to stand the test of time. So ask yourself this question, what is the value? How do you differentiate yourself? And the fourth question is, who is your customer? And I think that's again, something which most founders don't really are not able to clarify because they will say it's a consumer, it's a business, it's a chemical industry. Today, Technology gives you the ability to offer a product or a service to a customer of one. You have to be as specific as that. And then you have to see how many such customers exist. But if you say that, look, I will sell to everybody in the chemical industry or somebody who's got a process manufacturing plan, you need to be very clear about whether there are many other companies who can say exactly the same thing. What specific purpose of that do you is it uh, basically a pharmaceutical kind of a plant? Is it um, a plant which makes heavy, heavy chemicals? You have to be, is it a capacity plant which is of a certain size in a specific geography with a certain kind of output? You have to be very, very clear. It's the same thing when you talk about B2C. Who is your consumer? It can't be everybody. You have to be very specific. And one of the things which I found of, you know, I've been a judge of many startups. The startups which are clear about who the customer is, to whom they are offering their product or service, and are very clear about who that is, are the ones which are likely to succeed. And then the last question, it's not a question, but an observation, is I, I asked them that, what kind of people are you hiring? And if a lot of them will say, we're looking for people who are hardworking, who have initiative, who are aggressive, and I said, first determine who are you as a company? What are the values you cherish? What is the brand promise which you give? And then you decide what are the right people to fit that? What are the attributes of the people which will fit that? So it's very, very critical to understand that from day one itself, you have to determine these four or five questions, decide what are the value system and the culture which you want to create in your organization, and then you hire accordingly. You can't hire people and then decide what the culture is. You have to do that in advance so that it reinforces the whole thing. So culture is very, very critical. And it's for the founders from day one to establish what that culture, what the value system they want, because that will be integral to uh, their overall strategy. Basket, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the startups you are working with? Uh, and some of the challenges that they are facing uh, in growth and what do you think some of this, uh, you know, uh, how they can overcome some of these challenges? So, so to, to uh, basically there's really two major areas. 
Number one is focus because most of them had made such broad um, plans uh, based on their understanding of what their product did that they were never really able to focus. So I think it's very important to focus, which is your customer, what segment, how am I going to reach him? What is going to be the distribution channel? Uh, is it direct? Is it through partners? All of that is very, very critical. So it's focus, focus across multiple dimension. And the second is finance. Um, all of them, you know, once they get, uh, you know, the, the, the whole business model correct, once they get their uh, overall strategy correct, then the challenge is that after that initial success, how do you scale is where the challenge is. And that's where I think a lot of them are struggling at the present moment. So a lot of the companies which I'm working with, very exciting company, but it's about raising the next round of cash for, uh, for actually scaling the business to the next level. Uh, it's a pre-series A kind of uh, companies, yeah. So, and, and Funding and and, and do you think uh, in the current circumstances that we find ourselves, uh, this will be increasingly more challenging? Uh, can startups do something? Uh, of course, uh, specific industries will have specific challenges, but the startups that you're supporting, uh, can they do something uh, differently in these current circumstances? So I, I don't think uh, that uh, the current crisis will provide a shortcut. Uh, however, certain kinds of companies will, uh, their value will be perceived to be much higher. So any company which uh, enables empowerment of employees, either from work from home or enhancing their efficiency, or any kind of company which will enable, uh, in a sense, some form of social distancing where you can do work without uh, you know, or, or where you can do a lot more collaborative work, but not necessarily physically being together. Uh, those are the kinds of companies which uh, will find, um, uh, you know, because there's enough liquidity. It's not that there's a shortage of cash. I mean, the private equity companies and the VCs still have a lot of cash and it may not be the scenario if, the, you know, if this whole thing lasts for perhaps uh, 10 months or 12 months. But at the current stage, there is a lot of liquidity in the marketplace. And the uh, VCs and the uh, PEs are looking for good valuations. The valuations have come down and therefore they're looking for good deals at the moment. So if you've got your act together, if you are, uh, you know, if you've got um, a product or a service uh, which would be beneficial in today's times uh, based on social distancing, based on greater collaboration, based on where you can uh, fuel the, you know, supply chains or economic uh, e-commerce, then our healthcare, uh, there's our digital payments, there's enough uh, liquidity. So you just need to sharpen your focus and uh, you know, make sure that you're uh, presenting yourself uh, to the right uh, VCs and private equity companies. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna take a step back from that and uh, look at some of the larger issues around the IT and technology industry in general. Do you think, uh, the current circumstances and challenges uh, uh, could overwhelm India's IT industry. Do you think it's in as, as big an opportunity as, for example, the 2099-2000, where which helped India grow? Uh, how do you see this uh, unfolding? So, you know, I'd like to look at it um, from pre-COVID and post-COVID. So, as they say, AC versus BC. Um, so BC is before COVID and AC is after COVID. So let's talk about the period, uh, let's say just about a month back. So the IT industry in India was actually going through uh, a major, um, you know, ch ch set of challenges. And uh, what were those challenges? One was global slowdown. Uh, there were big, cha big issues around uh, supply chains. So uh, the whole IT business model, which was based upon uh, doing everything offshore uh, was coming into question because of uh, uh, the visa regulations and where everybody was looking at creating jobs within their own country. So that became a bit of a challenge. So global slowdown plus by uh, most countries focusing from within was creating some sort of a challenges. And I think the IT industry was slowly uh, getting out of that. And the the second area was the change in customer demands. Customers were no longer looking for just outsourcing of a basic infrastructure management, 
but the value was really in helping them to digitally transform. So technology outs, you know, the, I think the biggest problem which we will see going forward is that who is a technology company? Is SBI a technology company? Is Flipkart a technology company? Is uh, Bharat Petroleum or Hindustan Petroleum or ONGC, are they technologies, Reliance a technology company? They're all technology company. So therefore, when we say the IT industry, we're really talking about people who create products and services which they offer to their clients, right? So therefore, but otherwise, practically every country in the world will become a software company, or will have to become a software company, or will have to become an IT company in some form or the other. So if you look at what industry requires outside of the technology industry, what they required was basically digital transformation. That's where the bigger benefits were. By and large, most corporations have done the ERPs, they've done their uh, you know, uh, uh, banking solutions. Uh, they, the basic platforms were in existence, which basically fueled their internal transaction. But what they were now looking for is basically digital transformation. And basically, if you look at IT technology, it can really do four things for a company. Number one, it can help you to create new customer experiences. Number two is that it can help you to empower your own employees, make them more productive, more collaborative. Number three is that it can help you to optimize your business, your ERPs using analytics or supply chains using analytics. But more important, it can help you transform your business create new products and services, create new markets and customers, and create new business models. And that's the last one is where more and more companies, customers are coming and saying, hey, hey Indian IT industry, can you help me in that area? So this was where the IT companies, in Indian IT companies, had taken up the challenge. And there's been this great move towards AI, machine learning, even augmented and virtual reality, blockchain, and they've actually ramped up their uh, capabilities to be able to solve those kinds of problems. Uh, this required the, another, cha another challenge, which was talent development. How do you get more and more people with these kinds of skills? And therefore, there is a huge effort in India by the technology companies, as well as industry association, to reskill people, even the government of India, trying to get more people attuned to these latest technologies. And I think these were really the key, key challenges. Then on top of it, there were other complications, which were about that uh, data security and privacy. It became a big challenge. How do you build it into not just your products and services, but how do you build it into your supply chains? So therefore, there was a lot of effort in, as part of this overall uh, process that yes, we want to offer digital transformation, but we also need to be able to deliver it to a different business model, to different channels, different kind of uh, 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 methods, but also do it securely and reliably. I would say that those would have been the challenges. And post COVID, it's the same, except that now you have additional opportunities in terms of employee productivity, in terms of safety and security, in terms of greater need to automate, including manufacturing plants and IoT. So I think from a COVID perspective, there will be heightened move towards greater digitalization. In the 2008, 2009, it was more financial services which got impacted. Here, it will be very much more broad-based. Global supply chains will get, re uh, more plants will get completely automated. Uh, there will be greater focus on security and on uh, you know, healthcare. How do you work with greater social distancing? How do you sell your products? How will retail operate? How will hospitals? How do you manage that? Uh, you know, for example, everybody going into a building uh, will most probably have to get screened. How do you do that automatically? Not with the security guard pointing a gun at, you know, pointing a thermometer gun at you. How do you ensure that the air conditioning is clean and therefore it, uh, you know, it traps the viruses? So I think there's a huge opportunity for the IT industry and the technology industry in general. And that will, the COVID will bring about a lot of those opportunities and a lot of those changes. Uh, I'll start taking some of the questions that have uh, come uh, to me. Um, so Sri Amit Parikh from uh, the Gujarat Chamber of Commerce and Industry. 
He is asking how academia and industry can work together more effectively. And to give you a background, uh, Bhaskar, uh, at uh, Gujarat University, we've just completed building uh, a, a significant research and development park uh, where we are looking at collaborating with a number of uh, local businesses in pharmaceuticals and healthcare, uh, aviation. Uh, we're looking at a number of global collaborations. Uh, so, for example, uh, we've got uh, the DRDO setting up its lab uh, at, um, at Gujarat University. We are uh, getting a number of international collaborations in aviation there. Uh, how can, uh, therefore, academia and industry collaborate more uh, closely? And that's something you've worked on at Microsoft as well. And any ideas on how... Uh, at Gujarat University, we can improve that uh, collaboration. So, I mean, I don't have um, anything which uh, perhaps hasn't been tried or is not uh, under process as of now. I don't think I have any, any uh, you know, sort of unique ideas. But again, I think it is all about being very, very specific about the problem you're trying to solve, one. Number two is that it does require mentorship by the company, uh, by the industry. So it's not just about giving money. It is about active participation in actually solving the problem and then taking it to market. That I think is the best experience. It's about cutting down uh, and sometimes it may, it need not be, you know, it could be applied, which means that it's something which you can take to market very quickly, or it could be solving a big technology problem, which is what our research and development does, but which would then be used for products, which are five years down the line. The, they could be in you know, schools of very advanced learning. That could be more the focus, which is about uh, you know, creating a new technology, solving a technology problem as distinct from applied, where you're actually taking a customer related problem or a governance related problem or an environment related problem, using technology to solve that and taking it to market and productionizing it and then taking it to market very quickly. So I think it's really focused. You have to be very clear about what you want to do. Money is good to have. I think academia needs it because then they can pay the brightest minds instead of the brightest minds moving outside. But I think the focus is really about sharing the IP. That part of it is very, very critical. So I, I think you know industry understands that. And therefore, you've seen industry uh, operating a lot more. But if they don't put skin in the game, if they don't have a process, industry has a process, and uh, the university has a process, then you will find that you cannot sustain it. It's basically then a function of two individuals in two organizations getting together, it lasts for a couple of years, and individuals change, and everything falls down. So you need to build this at a grassroots level over a long period of time. Indeed, I mean, we are in fact trying to put together processes where we can uh, both collaborate and, as you said earlier, uh, be a win-win for both uh, industry and academia. Yeah, uh, it, it will definitely be because. You know, if you frankly, if you look at uh, the US and even China now, uh, that collaboration is very, very, um, you know, key to the innovation of the industry. I think everybody understands that because, uh, you know, it's, a, it's about brain power and uh, yeah, students and, um, you know, PhD scholars and academia, they have that IP. It's just that identifying the problem to solve is what industry can help and industry needs to participate so that they own that solution. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from somebody anonymously. Uh, Sir, you were smart enough to get into one of the IITs, uh, but what advice do you have for students who couldn't and where does failure, failure take you? How have you dealt with failure? You know, <laughs> if you haven't failed, you will never know what success is because it's what failure drives you to understand where your weaknesses are and how do you then overcome them. So I can't think of a single individual who's had success right through his life and who's never tasted failure. I mean, even a Sachin Tendulkar has never had a perfect innings. And even if he's had a perfect innings, he could have he himself said, look, I think it could have been even better. So therefore you have to understand that life is all about mistakes. It's how you overcome them is that what takes you forward. And let me just give you, you know, you keep, everybody keeps talking about IITs. You know, when I passed out in 1972, nobody had heard of the IITs. Nobody in the West knew what an IIT was. 
nobody in India knew what an IIT was. And if you wanted to get married, they'd say an engineer. Who wants to marry an engineer? We want to marry an IPS, IAS, or a you know, or a government server. Those jobs are much more stable. So it's this thing about IIT has only happened recently. So if you look at my generation of people who passed out from IIT, first of all, it was much simpler to get in. Number two is that uh, the ratios between students and uh, uh, teachers was much less. Uh, the, there were only five IITs. We had lots of job opportunities when we got out, but we weren't known as a brand. Okay, so I, I think you need to understand this that an IIT gives you a brand today, but like I said, what I got out of IIT was not the brand. I got the, because people recognized me as somebody who was a problem solver and a person who could continuously learn. So I, I, wasn't, being, I wasn't told to do a static problem. I could envisage the problem and think for a solution for it. And it didn't matter at what stage in my career I was. So I, need, I think you need to look at yourself from that respect, that education, engineering education, or any graduate education, what you get out of it is experiences. It gives you the ability to, to problem solve. It gives you the ability to constantly learn. If you just get those three, then you are set for life. Satya Nadella wasn't from IIT. He was from MIT, Manipal Institute of Technology. The head of um, uh, Nokia is also from MIT. The head of, um, uh, I think uh, there's a whole bunch of people from Branchi, from uh, Bits Pilani, uh, from MITs, and even some of the other smaller colleges who are now CEOs of companies. So again, it's a myth that it's only IITs who do well. Right. Uh, we'll go on to, I think, the last question, unless I get and not any other one. Uh, could you share some insights on how budding entrepreneurs can tackle the uncertainties of business and make us more, uh, make yourself more resilient and proactive? So I think I sort of answered that in terms of, you know, the kind of four questions which I ask um, any startup which whom I have an interaction with. What is your purpose? What is the uh, value which you provide to your customers? Who is your customer? How do you differentiate yourself? If you can answer those four, if you've got an idea and, and you can answer those four or five questions, you've got the beginnings of what I would call a business plan. And then it's about looking at how big is that opportunity and then how do you set up a company to basically address that opportunity. So to me, that's really what it's all about. The, the, Today, uh, the, um, you know, it's, the, why do people do startups? Is because they don't want to do this, you know, a job which is repetitive in nature. A uh, lot of younger, uh, you know, if I look at the come on the startups which I've been interacting with, it's amazing. The, uh, the, the clarity of their thinking, uh, the, the market or the, the, uh, the, the service or product which they're trying to create, the demand for that, uh, it, the opportunities are huge. And there's enough money to be able to fund that. And yes, uh, you know, that's the difference because in my time, there was no venture capitalists. There were only banks. So, um, Infosys was never funded by a VC. It actually used its own cash to generate uh, enough profits and money to start an IPO. So they went through like a regular company. Today, you have that whole ecosystem which is focused on startups. So this is a great opportunity and a great time to look at a startup. Excellent. With that note, uh, Akkar, I'd like to really thank you for your time today. Uh, it was really insightful. And I hope uh, some of our viewers have uh, got uh, excited about the post-COVID world, if, if one can do that. Um, so I'd like to hand it back to the GeoSec team and Rahul. Uh... Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Bhaskar. That was extremely insightful. I'm being told that uh, we're getting some amazing feedback on Facebook already. Uh, so thank you everyone who could join us through Zoom, Facebook, and a couple of other channels that we have posted this on. Thank you, Bhaskar, for the time and for such amazing insights. 
uh, we'd love to have you sometime again in the near future uh, in some other form or fashion to talk to our startup we have over 120 startups that we support at at Geus Tech and like Saurav said uh, we are we are building uh, one of the first research and innovation parks for any state university in the country and uh, we are we are we're very close to initiating the operations around it uh, we'd love to have your inputs uh, there on how to bridge industry academia collaborations uh, thank you so much thank you everybody who joined and uh, and and uh, stay safe everyone yeah thank you everybody thank you for hosting me um, and um, sure up thanks for the incisive questions that really made it more interesting you, we had a prepared script, but I think we went off the script completely. So yes, thank you for yes. that. I think it made it uh, that much more interesting for me also. So yes, this is a great medium to share ideas, but unfortunately it's one way. Uh, I do look forward to an opportunity for greater interaction. Thank you. And everybody stay safe. Perfect. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye guys. Bye.